to Rain and then to Professor Lim. So we've known from the outset of this pandemic that variants have always been inevitable and we've seen many come and the names include Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, with which you will all be familiar, and there are others. When a variant appears, it always causes initial concern because at that point, we don't know quite how it will behave. And in particular, we don't know how our vaccines will hold up against that variant. And it's always been the case that at some point, we've always said it, we are going to get a variant that gives us heightened concern. And we are at that moment with Omicron. It is the new kid, new kid on the block for now. And I think it's true to say that scientists around the world, not just in the UK, unfortunately agree that this one is of increased concern. But in acknowledging that concern, I want to be very clear and I want to emphasize the very high degree of current uncertainty in our knowledge. There are far more things we don't know yet than things we do know. Now that is going to change very rapidly as scientists around the world mobilize on this over I predict the next three weeks. But please, everyone needs to give us time to assemble that data. What we can say, um, in terms of the things that we're certain of at this point, that the Omicron variant has many mutations. Some of them are ones which we already know something about, and some of them are new. But the number of mutations present already on first principles makes us worry about a possible effect on vaccine effectiveness. The other thing that is certain at the moment is that in South Africa, there is definitely an elevated growth rate associated with the Omicron variant. That is not the same as saying there is definitely an increase in transmissibility compared to the previous Delta variant that they experienced. That is a piece of science that still needs a bit more work. And so the uncertainties are transmissibility, severity of disease, where there is no definitive signal at this point from South Africa. But we should all note that even without increased severity, as the case numbers grow, then hospitalizations will also grow. And finally, on the effects of the new variant and how well vaccine effectiveness will hold up, here I want to be clear that this is not all doom and gloom at this stage, and I do not want people to panic at this stage. If vaccine effectiveness is reduced, as seems pretty likely to some extent, the biggest effects are likely to be in preventing infections, and hopefully there will be smaller effects on preventing severe disease. But that is something that is there for scientists to work out in the next few weeks. There is also some science, which um, Professor Lim will refer to in more detail, that higher antibody levels protect better than lower antibody levels. And, and, and I know that Professor Lim will come back to that. So for the meantime, whilst we work this out, there are two basic things that the scientists will have to do. The first is to get some live Omicron virus and test that against the blood samples from people who've already been double vaccinated and people who've been double vaccinated and then boosted. And that will be part of the data picture that comes together to tell us exactly what's going on with vaccine effectiveness. And the other piece that can be done is epidemiological studies, which as you know, involve very large numbers of people and you also need large numbers of cases. And at the moment, the only place that those kind of studies can realistically be done um, are in South Africa. And there we rely on the World Health Organization and the South African Public Health Authorities 
who are truly excellent and I hope they will get us an answer soon. And on that point, I think we have to again um, pay tribute to um, the excellence of South African science and the transparency of the authorities there in helping bring this problem to the world's attention at the earliest moment they possibly could have done so. So that's the kind of backdrop, if, you, if I may, um, to the announcement that will be made um, in just a moment or two. And before that, I shall turn to um, Dr. Rain to give an update on uh, the safety situation uh, and the booster program in particular. Dr. Rain. Thank you. As the UK's independent regulator, our role is to continue to ensure that safe and high quality and effective vaccines are provided to the public. Your safety is always our highest priority, and we've continued to proactively monitor the safety of all COVID-19 vaccines since the rollout began a year ago. And our regulatory position remains that COVID vaccines available for use in the UK, and that's the Pfizer-BioNTech, AstraZeneca, and Moderna vaccines, have an overwhelmingly positive benefit-risk balance in their licensed use. Our role means ensuring that continued use uh, uh, can be conducted in an effective way, and we confirmed in September that available vaccines can be used as safe and effective booster doses. Since the access to boosters was extended to be rolled out in people aged 40 and over, we have identified no new safety concerns. Our careful review of the data found that the majority of adverse events were mild or moderate and related to reactogenicity, the vaccine working, such as sore arm or headache or tiredness. And so when you're called for your booster dose, you can come forward confident that the benefits of the vaccine by preventing serious COVID-19 outweigh any risks. Briefly turning to people aged 12 to 15 years, and ahead of our authorization back in June to extend the approval of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, we carried out a robust regulatory review to determine that this vaccine is safe and effective for this younger age group and we carried out a thorough review of all clinical trial data, and since then, we've continued to monitor. And monitoring all the side effects age under 18 has shown that these, again, raise no new safety issues. So our message to people aged 12 to 15 is that it's safe to have a second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And if you're called to receive your second dose, please go and take up that offer, and it will ensure that you're further protected from COVID-19. Turning to the new variant, and just to be clear, as we've heard, we do not have evidence at the moment that the vaccines being used do not work against the new Omicron strain, but we're making this issue a priority, and we're in discussion with vaccine manufacturers and the World Health Organization on potential modifications that may be needed for the current vaccines to be maximally effective against the new variants if required. But my message here is that you can be reassured that no vaccine will be authorized for supply in the UK unless the expected standards of safety, of quality and of effectiveness are met. Thank you, JVT. Thank you, Dr. Rain. I'm now going to turn to Professor Lim to make the substance of the JCVI announcement today. Thank you, Wei Shen. Thank you. JCVI has been meeting regularly, once to two times a week over the last few weeks, because we are constantly reviewing the vaccine program and constantly looking ahead to what changes might be needed. Since the emergence of Omicron, we have redoubled our efforts, and in the last few days, we've been reviewing vaccine response measures in the light of this emerging new variant. There are two important considerations that underpin our advice. The first is the importance of boosters, and this is a really important point. The vaccines that we are using in the UK and that are being used globally were developed against the original wild-type virus. Viruses that develop variants and that are different compared to the wild-type original virus increase the likelihood of a mismatch between the vaccine on the one hand and the variant on the other hand. 
the larger the mismatch between vaccine and variant, the greater the likelihood that the level of protection provided by the vaccine will be lowered. From what we know about the Omicron variant so far, it may be that the vaccines that we have at the moment may be less good than against the current circulating Delta variant. One way of reducing the impact of this mismatch between vaccine and variant is to increase the strength of the immune response provided by the current vaccine. In other words, if we can raise the level of the immune response generated by the vaccine, that higher level of immune response will reach out and provide extra protection to mismatched variants. And that is what we can do, fortunately, because we know that with the mRNA vaccines, the Moderna vaccine and the um, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and to a lesser extent, the AstraZeneca vaccine, a boost of these um, vaccines provides a very, very strong immune response. The immune response provided with the boost is measured to be higher than the immune response attained after the second dose. So there's a stepwise increase. And this increase in the immune response will broaden the protection hopefully also against the new variant. That's the first important consideration. The second important consideration is timing. With any vaccine during a pandemic, we get the greatest benefit of the vaccine, both for individuals and society, if the vaccine is deployed before the wave starts. If we deploy a vaccine in the middle of the wave or after even the peak of a wave, then the benefit from the vaccine is much lower. We therefore want to provide boosters early enough such that it is before any possible wave. I'm not here predicting that there will be a wave of the new variant, but should there be a wave, we want to be in the best possible position. So there's an advantage in having boosters, and there's an advantage in boosting before any imminent wave arrives. With those two principles in mind, we have five pieces of advice that we want to give as part of the vaccine response against this new variant. The first, we're advising that the booster program should now be extended to adults aged 18 to 39 years old. This is in addition to the existing program for boosters, meaning that from now, all adults aged 18 years and above would be eligible for a booster. The second piece of advice is that the booster program should follow prioritization according to age and being in an at-risk group. In other words, somebody with an underlying health condition that puts them at higher risk of COVID-19. The reason for this is that we have not seen any data to suggest the new variant is in any way different from the previous variants in terms of who is most at risk of severe disease. As we know from before, older age persons and people with underlying health conditions are at higher risk of severe disease. And so we want to protect them as a priority. The booster program is therefore prioritized now according to age, with the booster dose given no sooner than three months after the second dose. The third piece of advice is that people who are severely immunocompromised should also now be offered a booster dose. For them, this would be their fourth vaccine dose. The first three doses they've received so far counts as their primary cause, and the booster dose will be their fourth dose. Once again, the booster dose should be given no sooner than three months after their last vaccine dose or the third dose. Fourthly, regardless of the type of vaccine that was given for the primary cause, the first two doses, 
either of the mRNA vaccines, that is the Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, can and should be used in preference as the booster vaccine. The Moderna vaccine at 50 micrograms, which is half the dose used in the primary cause, and the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine at 30 micrograms, the standard adult dose, both give extremely good antibody levels. They generate a very strong immune response given as a boost. There are some people who are unable to receive an mRNA vaccine, and they may have had the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, both for their first dose and their second doses. For them, we advise that they receive as their booster the AstraZeneca vaccine again. The AstraZeneca vaccine does give a good boost, albeit not as good as the Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines, but it's still a good boost, and we would advise that they have a boost rather than have no booster dose at all. Lastly, we advise that children aged 15, sorry, 12 to 15 years are offered a second dose of vaccine at the standard dose of 30 micrograms of Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine 12 weeks after their first dose. This is the same schedule as for 16 and 17 year olds at the moment. We are closely watching the emerging data on Omicron. And if there is a need to advise that the dose interval between dose one and dose two for children should be altered, then we will do so. At the moment, the dose interval between dose one and dose two for 12 to 15 year olds and 16 and 17 year olds is 12 weeks. Overall, the priority is the booster program, particularly for older adults and those with underlying health conditions that put them at higher risk from COVID-19. The majority of people who are aged 50 years and above are already eligible for a booster. Some of those who are already eligible have not yet received their booster vaccination. I strongly urge everyone who is already eligible to please make the effort, book your appointment and have the booster. That will be the best way to protect yourselves, your loved ones and the wider society against any possible new variant wave of infection. Thank you. Thank you, Wei Shen. So um, before we open for questions, I'd just like to kind of sum up a little bit. Today, we've heard some very reassuring words from uh, Dr. Rain about the safety of the booster program as it is monitored in an ongoing way. And I think the three key themes we've heard in relation to Omicron and the JCV advice are uncertainty, concern, and timing. An opportunity now to get the timing right. Um, JCVI has today announced renewed urgency and further expansion of the UK booster programme. We don't know what's going to happen next. As I explained to you, the next three weeks are going to be weeks of scientific uncertainty. But whilst we wait for the mist to clear on what this concerning variant actually means, there is no time to delay. It's our opportunity to get ahead and vaccine boosting is the thing we can do most easily whilst we wait for that science mist to clear. So to me, and as you know, I love football, um, we started with 11 players in the team with the Wuhan vaccine. And you could say that we've kind of picked up a couple of injuries when Alpha came along and then Delta came along. Uh, those variants that are slightly different from the Wuhan uh, original strain and um, we've had to use our subs off the bench to keep us in the game but we're well in the game and you can see that with the current epidemiology in relation to Delta that the vaccines are holding up very well and largely keeping us out of trouble. Now Omicron is like now picking up a couple of yellow cards to key players on top. 
we may be okay, but we're kind of starting to feel at risk that we might go down to 10, 10 players. And if that happens, or if that's a risk that it's going to happen, then we need everyone on the pitch to up their game in the meantime. And that's really upping your game in terms of boosters and in terms of antibody responses. We're not going to wait for the red card to happen. We're going to act decisively now. And we're asking everyone to up their game. Um, we're asking everyone to play their part in the urgency now of the booster programme coming forward the moment you are called by the NHS. It's really, frankly, never been more vital that, uh, that the booster campaign has never been more vital than at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to open for questions, and the first question is from Jim Reid at the BBC. Thanks very much indeed. This sounds like quite a significant or a very significant extension of the booster programme. Can you tell us how confident you are that the NHS can deliver all these doses before Christmas, or are there going to be people that are just going to struggle to get these appointments before that festive break? So this is very new guidance indeed, as you'll understand, Jim. We've had to work at extreme pace, uh, given the news coming out of South Africa being so recent. Um, the NHS is now working through the updated guidance, and it's going to set out in the next few days how that's going to be operationalised. I would say it is undoubtedly a very complex phase in the NHS vaccination programme because we've still got people coming for first doses, thankfully, second doses, um, as well as third doses for the immunocompromised and boosters and young people in schools. So there's a, a great deal going on. I think the important message that the NHS wanted me to convey to you today is that um, they understand the real urgency of this. Um, they are up for the task, but they say that they will contact you when you need to act, and uh, they will open the booking in a kind of orderly way, because what we, one of the things we really don't want is um, people from the very youngest now eligible cohorts somehow getting in front of people who are much at much higher risk of a bad outcome if they were to get COVID-19. Emily Morgan at the, from ITV. You. Um, you just asked people not to panic, but you're reducing the gap between the second dose and the booster from five months to three months. Isn't yes. that a sign that you yourself are extremely worried about this variant and people will naturally panic? So I'm going to allow Wei Shen to answer the question on the um, interval. Um, but in terms of the kind of panic bit, I'm asking people not to panic, but I'm not asking them either to completely ignore the weather forecast. And, um, you know, we, we look at South Africa, it's our kind of weather forecast here, um, in the same way that, you know, the weather forecasters have warned us about Storm Arwood in the recent few days. You know, you can't ignore what you see around the world, uh, and it is more urgent than ever before because of what's happened. But on the three-month point, there's a, a very specific answer that, that uh, Wei Shen should give you. Thank you. In general, on immunological principles, the longer the duration between one dose and the next, particularly a booster dose, the better the effect. We know this not just from COVID-19 vaccines, but also other vaccines in other immunization programs. So where it is possible, it is usually uh, advisable and beneficial to extend the duration between two vaccine doses, which is what we've tried to do from the very start. On the balance of that, we also need to be aware that, as I said, timing of a vaccine dose is important. We don't want to wait so long that a wave is upon us and we haven't delivered the booster dose either. So we need to strike a balance between waiting longer, uh, but not waiting so long we miss the chance. In shortening the dose duration, we've chosen three months because there are data from the cough boost study, which is a trial that was carried out in the UK and is due to be published soon, that show that if you give a booster dose at about a three-month uh, interval from dose two, 
one still sees a very strong boost response. A lot of the other trials have used a longer interval between dose 2 and the booster dose and show a very strong response. But this trial in the UK showed that very strong response even when the booster dose was given at three months. So we feel that it is reasonable to shorten the duration to three months, but no shorter than that, because that is where the evidence lies. We can give a booster dose at three months and expect a good response based on trial data. We don't want to go too early. Thank you, Wei Shen. Tom Clark from Sky News. Thanks. Um, given that people in younger age groups will be waiting three months for their booster jab, many of them, I imagine, won't maybe get a booster until Omicron, assuming it is more transmissible, makes its way here in large numbers. Did the JCVI consider whether it would be better to use those doses elsewhere in the world? Um, I mean, I, taking your premiership, your football analogy, you know, is it time the premiership was a bit more generous to less uh, fortunate leagues, less wealthy leagues, and share the vaccine around it. That is, after all, what these new variants are teaching us. Do you want me to take that one? Yeah. So, look, on the point about um, global supply of vaccines, all public health people in the UK and around the world are very clear that none of us are safe until we're all safe, and we're very committed to the international supply of vaccines to all countries. Um, so far... The UK has donated um, 30.6 million doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, and already the scheduled in commitments for 2022 amount to another 20 million doses of Oxford AstraZeneca and 20 million Janssen doses um, that were also ascribed to the UK. So this means, you know, we, we'll have given um, half of our total order of AstraZeneca to countries in need. But we also have a responsibility to um, try to lock in and protect the gains we've made against this virus in the UK. And it's a difficult, hard balancing act. Chris Smythe. Thank you. Uh, just more broadly with the situation with Macron in the UK, the, the Scottish Government said this morning they found cases with no history of travel. They've suggested community transmission is underway there. There are clearly dozens of suspected cases in England suggesting that there is some element of community transmission more widely. How concerned should we be uh, about this and what does it tell us about the potential increased transmissibility of this variant? And I suppose secondly linked to that, even if it is more transmissible and it already is here in large numbers, um, given how many uh, Delta cases there are, it's probably going to be into the new year before it becomes dominant, even if it is as bad as feared. And therefore is the hope that we can actually get the vast majority of those most at risk boosted before that wave that you talked about hit? So um, it is important for us now, having the advance warning that we've had, thanks to the South African authorities, to try and slow the ingress of a variant into the UK. And we do that because the science is uncertain at the moment about how the vaccines will hold up and the extent to which they will hold up. They're clearly going to hold up better based on the science with boosters, and we want to buy time to do that. So these are all interrelated points. And yes, the more boosting we can do by the time we have any significant amount of Omicron activity in the UK is going to be very, very important. How fast that will build up in the UK and to what extent it will build up in the UK is something we don't know. We're in uncharted territory. We do have already a highly vaccinated population, but not yet as fully a boosted population as we would like. There are many people still over the age of 50 who have not yet come forwards for a booster, and they are particularly at risk um, from a drifted variant um, if w without that booster so that's really important and um, you know I, I don't you, like you I don't have any concrete timelines at the moment but I can say it's as urgent as it could possibly be Nick McDermott at the Sun 
Um, a quick question for Professor Lim. Um, one of your colleagues described the decision JCB has to make as slightly a bit of a Goldilocks moment. You've got to pick a kind of the right time, not too hot, not too cold. Um, it, you explained your timings, but can you explain to the public, particularly younger people, why over the next few weeks they do need a booster? And I don't see any downsides in your plan, so why didn't we enact this sooner with Delta so prevalent? Why wait so late? Um, for Dr Rain, um, we've seen the EMA approve Pfizer 5 to 11 year olds, but now it's been batted over, hopefully to the MHRA. Um, would we expect uh, a response from your team before Christmas? And then a quick one for um, Professor Van Tam. Um, you talked about the need for boosters and of a team effort to ramp up um, the numbers. Uh, the Sun's encouraging the Jabs Army to get together with 25,000 more volunteers to come forward. Is that the kind of action we need to see over the next few days if we're going to try and get ahead of Omicron? Thank you. Wei Shen, would you like to yes, start? Yes, if I, if I can start first. So thank you for asking about the uh, younger adults. Um, the current variant that's circulating is Delta, and the vaccine effectiveness against Delta is not as good as it was against Alpha, and that's because Delta is a variant which is slightly mismatched compared to the wild-type original virus that the vaccines were developed against. Nonetheless, the vaccine protection against severe disease in younger people, 18 to 39 years old, for Delta is extremely good. It's over 95% protection. Really, really very good vaccine. And at the three-month mark, certainly even at the five-month mark, uh, that protection has not really waned very much against Delta. So if we were only dealing with a Delta variant, as we have been up till now, then we have confidence that we can keep going and not deploy the booster quite so soon. Harnessing the advantage, as I said before, that a longer duration between doses is better. But that is not the situation we might be in should we have a wave of the new variant, particularly if the new variant is highly mismatched against vaccine. And so it is for that reason that we are now saying let's not wait any further before opening the booster program to younger adults. Let's bring the younger adults into the booster program now so that any drop in vaccine protection that they might get uh, will be mitigated by having the booster dose. Thank you. An application for use of the Pfizer vaccine in children aged 5 to 11 will be very, very carefully assessed, as you would expect, for safety, for effectiveness at the proposed dose, and for quality. And you ask if this will be concluded, this rigorous assessment by Christmas. I would say very likely. And I say that because, as you'll be aware, we've allowed use of the vaccine for at-risk children since very early on, and we've collected a certain amount of safety data in this population. So in terms of time frame, very likely before Christmas, but we don't know until we've rigorously looked at all the data. Uh, Nick, you very cleverly managed to get uh, three questions into the same sentence, so uh, well done. Um, but your question to me was about um, the effort required now on the booster programme and um, about the, the Sun Jabs Army. So um, the specific details of how uh, this will be operationalised in the NHS are for the NHS to announce in the next uh, few days. But I do think back to the kind of, you know, the, the almost heady days of um, uh, early 2021 when um, it was a true national effort and we were very grateful to your army of volunteers for the help they gave. It is going to take that kind of spirit again to um, work at the, with the same kind of enthusiasm as, and pace now to um, get us into the best possible position we can be in the weeks ahead. And the final question today comes from Hugo Guy at the I. Uh, Professor Lim, uh, you've, the JCVI has acted very quickly to, to make this decision. You were asked to speed up your decision making and 
and um, it, it's less than a week since, since the Omicron variant came up. Why, why can you act so quickly now and yet previously you've taken quite a long time to make decisions, for example, uh, starting the booster campaign uh, initially and, and, and rolling vaccines out to children? What, what do you say to critics who, who say that the JCVI acts too slowly until the moment when it's forced to speed up like now? And, and can I ask, um, pregnant women have often felt uh, confused and left out of the advice. Is there any, does all your advice, uh, updated advice from today, apply equally to pregnant women, or is there anything specific they should be aware of? Thank you. So maybe if I start with the second question first on pregnant women, because that's easier to answer. All the advice that we describe applies to pregnant women. Um, as regards the speed of advice, uh, there is a time to move quickly, and there is a time to move more cautiously. You may remember that when the vaccine program was first launched last year, JCVI moved swiftly. Uh, and it, over the summer months, when uh, we had time to move at the same pace as data were emerging, uh, we felt that it was right to, if you will, shorten our stride so that we did not outpace the emerging data. And that meant that we could be as careful as possible uh, given the circumstances. But when circumstances change and there's a need for swifter decision making, then we will act more quickly. There will certainly be critics who will always uh, argue one way or the other that we're going either too fast or too slow at different times. But I would suggest that um, Going quickly all the time isn't always the best, uh, and going slowly all the time isn't always the best either. And we have to make some judgment as to when to go faster and when to go slower, given that there is always uncertainty in the evidence, and we're always trying to keep abreast of the data as much as possible. Thank you, Wei Shen. So um, that concludes today's briefing. It is onwards and upwards, upwards with the antibody levels. That is the key task ahead of us now for adults in the UK. Thank you very much. This briefing is over.